All right, First, first Kings 14, and again, we're going to look at uh, this King Rehoboam and the Sodomite culture that he was, that was about him, believe it or not, and we'll look at that tonight. Uh, I want us to get step back, because again, we're studying the book of Kings, and I don't want to just get lost in the forest here of interesting things in the Bible text. If we step back in what we're looking at, the kings, they're about kings, first and second kings. Um, it began in Samuel. We see first Samuel, we, have, we learn of Saul, and we learn of David too, but second, in second Samuel, David becomes officially king. These are the first, the first king of Israel, man's choice, second king, God's choice, and th this one didn't really have a heart. This one had all heart for God. This one had a split heart, right? Okay, so you have Saul, David, Solomon, and David becomes the standard that God always refers back to, not because of perfection, but because, you know, in spite of his couple big sins... God says, you know, you should have been at least like my, my servant David that followed me with all his heart. Even when he was confronted with sin, he just he, he repented and worked through it and uh, finished well. Solomon, of course, glorious kingdom. Wow, we spent 11 chapters of talking about Solomon. And, uh, but, you know, again, his heart didn't go fully with the Lord. He accommodated this multiplicity of foreign wives and and having these uh, pagan temples and building them. And so it, it was messy. After Solomon, because God told him this, this is what's going to happen, Solomon's son is Rehoboam. Okay? Rehoboam died, and, and his son was about the only good person that came from him. And, and we talked about how God gave this one blind prophet insight on speaking to him. Now we're going to look at Rehoboam, and I, we should be basically done with these two kings, and we'll progress through the king's uh, as God leads us after this. But tonight we're going to look at Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, and just it gives us a sketch of his life. But remember when he came to power? What happened when he came to power? Something happened. He had two groups of people of, he dealt with. What happened when he came to power? Brand new king, and some people came to him. Who was it? Somebody came to him and said something. Some of them, the men came to him. It may have been the workers, but what kind of men were they? Old or young? What's that? People came to him. Well, they had both. But he had people came to him and said, "Can you make your fa the fa your father's uh, uh, your father was kind of tough on us, okay?" And apparently Solomon, you know, in some aspect, he was he was like you know. Uh, type A, CEO type, we're going to grow this business, you know, and, you know, so he came to him, and the older men said, you know, um, you ought to lighten up on some people, lighten up on them a little bit, and if you lighten up on them, they're going to love you, and you serve them. The older men that knew his dad told him that. And we know your dad. We know how it was. But my dad, you're going to think my dad's waist is this big. He's nothing compared to me, and I'm going to chastise you with scorpions. And, you know, and he just, like, he tried to, you tell him who's the big shot. And he tried doing that, and it, it was a mess. And um, so he kind of fumbled his way through as he began. Obviously, the kingdom was split. He only had two tribes. And, but let's look at this tonight. And I, 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 we, got, we have to work through this. <laughs> We have to work through this because of the subject matter. Let's look at this. 1 Kings and 14. Let's just read. It gives us a sketch of some of his reign in these verses. 1 Kings 14, 21. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. And Rehoboam was 40 and 1 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus. And Judah, that's who he ruled over, did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed, above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also Sodomites in the land, and they did, 
according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass in the fifth year of Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah. And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. And Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried in, uh, buried with his fathers in the city of David. And his mother's name, as he already told us once, his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus. And Abijam, his son, reigned in his stead. Here's, a, here's this passage again where we're introducing, go to the next slide, to, to Rehoboam. Again, here's a map. Um, here's Israel. It basically, this is most of the land they should have had. Once they split, you have this kingdom and that kingdom. The northern kingdom, which technically had ten tribes, and the southern kingdom, which had uh, two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. From now on, they're pretty much called Judah. When you look at the history in the book of Kings, you read in this king, and then that king, and this king. It's typically going back and forth between the kings up here and the kings down here. And which ones are usually the worst? Which ones are usually the worst? What's that? The, one, the northern kingdom. In fact, only one time does one look a little bit okay. It, it may have been Jehu, the guy who drives furiously. He's a rage, you know, road rage guy. Uh, that's about the only one that looks a little bit good. And even then he blew it. But if there's any good, it usually is here in Judah, here and there. All right? At the end, they, all, they both go into captivity. So we're talking about Rehoboam ruling right here. Okay, so it says here, it brings up the, this idea of them being perversion in the land. All right, let's go to the next, go to the next uh, thing. The basic thing we're going to look at tonight is kind of this, I'm going to have several points, but this, the overall thing that we want to let just grab onto tonight is this, <laughs> is that we have to, we have to choose to govern our lives righteously in spite of or regardless of the sodomite culture around us. The sodomite. The Bible used the word sodomite. And I'll keep the language proper tonight, but it's basically a male who's doing perverted things with another male. And it's against God's design. Now, again, the Bible uses this word. It's amazing there's some newer... I try not to make it a deal to pick on newer translations. The newer translations, they change that word. They, they just say, they'll say male prostitute or temple uh, prostitute. It's kind of vague. You're going, what? What's that? Ah, it could be anything. This is a specific thing. This is a specific thing. I looked up the definition of it, and I kind of already gave you the definition. The old definition, Webster's 1828, they're own cultural thing. It's even infecting definitions and dictionaries. All right? The L, G, B, T, A, B, C, Q, R, X, you know, the, that culture. And we're going, oh, but it's about us, and we're going to have to manage through it. Well, here he had this. All right, so let's look at a few observations about this. Well, first of all, um, from the text. Let's look at four points from the text, and then I want to give you some, a few other things as we close. Notice that this thing, this, it says in verse 24, while this man was ruling, there were also sodomites in the land. I want to know, the first point is that this happens, number one, after a time of prosperity and religious compromise. Just hear what I said. There's kind of a, I don't know what it is. I, I'm kind of as an observer when I look in the Bible and I look at points in history. I notice sometimes that this stuff creeps up. Sexual perversions creep up and kind of take dominant form. That's what I've seen in countries after a long period of prosperity and religious compromise. Did you know Sodom and Gomorrah were prosperous places? They were prosperous places. Lot wanted to go there. Man, this looks good over here. And it had a good economy. And then the Roman Empire, if you look at some of the Roman Empire, some of those emperors were everything orientation. And, and so... Here you have, well, well who was, the, who was the, the king before him? Before Rehoboam, who was it? Solomon, again, the best economy right there. Was it 40 years I think he reigned? I mean, there's just, it, it, they were fat in that sense. That everything was going good. There was no war. People were like, whoa, we want to go see this. 
what glorious land and this glorious king. It was a great economy. And every man, it says, you know, they had their fig tree and they were basically everybody's, everybody's personal economy was good. There's a, I'm paraphrasing one of the verses there. And so I think so, and then, but, but on top of that, religious compromise. He starts to, oh yeah, we got prosperity, but we'll let this temple in, and we'll let that temple in, and we'll, let, we'll build this. And so Solomon combined religious compromise with prosperity, and you're going to have all kinds of stuff. That's where we're at. We've got a lot, we've had years and years of prosperity, and we're really just becoming very, you know, the, the religious compromise and all that stuff, and it's this formula for this type of culture. So you see, number one, that, okay, we're reading about Rehoboam, that number one, there are sodomites in the land, number, the sodomites come after a time of prosperity and religious compromise. Number two, we see, we have to, we got to let the Bible speak to us, and this is offensive to the, to the Facebook and, and everything else. But number two, it's allowed by the king. Look at this, chapter 14, verse 21. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned. He's a king. He didn't have to have the vote. He didn't have to have two houses of Congress say it. He reigns. He's king. It's a, it's a monarchy. He's reigning. What else did this king, do you know this king had something else on his side that it's not just, not just the fact that he was a king and he could just start calling the shots by and large? He had something else on his side at this point. Law. He had God's law. The Bible, there's, <laughs> the Bible talks about different things that you should allow and you shouldn't allow in laws of the land by way of their, the priests were concerned with the ceremonial stuff, Levitical stuff, and then the king needed to be highly aware of moral and civil law. He needed to be, in fact, he was told when the king becomes a king, he needs to take the book of the law and write his own copy by hand. He was supposed to do that. Did you know that? A king was told to handwrite their own copy and read it all the days of their life so their heart doesn't get lifted up. So they stay humble and they carry out God's law. His king is king. Rehoboam comes in as king. He's ruling. He is not the perfect. He's no Solomon. But he has pockets of sodomites. He has pagan worship. He could say, thus saith the Lord. That doesn't go here. And that doesn't go here. He had the law on his side. He did. And God has said, I'm going to, there's some verses that says, you know, the, in Leviticus, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. I think it's Leviticus 19. You shall not, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, 30 something, you shall not prostitute your daughter to be a whore, nor have a sodomite son. That's what it says. In other words, allow that to be. The word's only used five times. Sodomite's only used five times in the Bible. The concept's in there bigger. Uh, I believe it's three times in this first Kings. It, take, it took a while. Look at, look at the next king, two kings later, I should say. Chapter 15, verse 9. In the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa reigned Asa over Judah. Forty and one years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Ab Abishalom. Asa did that which is right, verse 11, in the sight of the eyes of the Lord, as, David, as did David his father. And he, Asa, King Asa, took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his father had made. So who are we talking about? We're talking about there's Solomon, there's Rehoboam, there's this other son, Abijam, and then there's his son, Asa. Rehoboam has this culture, and he's not doing anything about it. His next son doesn't. He didn't last long. Asa comes in, and Asa took some out of, takes him out of the land. But did you know what? It, it took a while. He didn't even get them all out of the land. If you get to the back of the book of 1 Kings, look what else it says. It tells the next king, which is Jehoshaphat. Asa's son is Jehoshaphat, and it says, Jehoshaphat, uh, chapter... 22, verse 46. This is Jehoshaphat. And the remnant of the Sodomites, which remained in the days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. It took two generations to get that out. It took two generations. 
And so here it is. There's the king. Let's just, we're looking at this king. He's ruling. He allows it. Um, it didn't even look like he tried. Maybe it's because, what was his mother? What was his mother? An Ammonitus. Now, we're not picking on somebody of a different race, right? But it didn't seem like she converted. And so her values came with her. Perhaps she, she can't say it in twice. Oh, his mom was an Ammonitus. His mom was an Ammonitus. Did we say his mom was an Ammonitus? It's like the chapter's telling us that. And it, if you do the math, it looks like Solomon had married her right before he even became king. You do the math when, before Solomon became king. And so anyways, he has her, and so maybe, maybe she was tolerant of it because some of the other nations, because God says, here, Israel, this is how we are in family. This is how we are in sexuality. This is how we are. Don't be like the nations around you. Don't be like them. Perhaps she brought that in and said, no, it's okay. So I don't know. I don't know. But, but he, he, here, the point is, here we're reading about Rehoboam. He's king. The Sodomites are there after this time of prosperity. He's allowing it as a king. Look, I can't control a lot of things. I try to vote stuff for our society and everything and make my voice known. But all I can, allow, all I can do is allow or disallow what's in my own realm, right? Right? Let's just do that. Let's just stop right here. The whole lesbian, gay stuff, is, it's a mess. But one of the things we can do is a couple things. We can, we can kind of screen our own influences, right? Our own media, music, books. we got to screen it the best we can. And then in particular for our kids, we got to make sure that we're um, uh, setting a good example for them, too, on marriage and family and on teaching about sexuality and family. We got we to gotta teach that and we got to be a good example of that. Sometimes kids run one way or another because there's been some bad experiences and some bad observations. So we got to make sure we're modeling family, we're, model, we're teaching at the appropriate age proper sexuality. You don't, do, no, boys, you don't do this over here. And the girls, you just say, the, you know the do's and don'ts, come on. And we have to do that to help avoid this kind of, That's what I can govern. I'm no, I'm no Rehoboam, but I am for my own house to a certain extent. i got to do my best with that, right? How do you think some of this stuff comes up anyways? It's just like this, let, we let go, we let go, we let go, we let go, and then it just festers out into society. So anyway, so here it is. It's allowed. It's, it came after a time of prosperity. We're going to see next. It, it's, it, do you realize the third point is it abides even in a religious culture? Look what it says there. It abides even in a religious culture. He says in chapter 14, Judah, verse 22, Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. For, this is a religious description now. For they what? They built them high places, this elevated cultic shrines, and images and groves on every high hill and every green tree. And there were also Sodomites in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations, which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Here's what I want you to see. Israel, when it's describing Israel, it's saying, hey, they still had religion, but they had this. They had these, uh, you know, these pagan shrines and groves at these high places, and they just forsook God, worshiping the true and living God according to the true word of God, and they just did their own thing, which all kinds of things were involved in that. But just because you still have religion doesn't mean it's going to scare away perversions. Sometimes it can go hand in hand. Because some people have the idea, well, you just need to have God, man. You need to have religion. You need to go to church. You can, but people, all kinds of perversions can still exist in a church or in, in things like that if there's not a true, strong message behind it. So... Here you have, they're still, they're still there. Uh, uh, it abides even in a religious culture. We have to watch. I was looking this up, and I, wasn't, I got a whole list, and I'm not going to spend my time on it. But I looked at something, and it came to my attention recently, and even Adam brought it to my attention. I'm amazed at how... See, we're a conservative-type church on, on music, and uh, I'm not afraid to look kind of outside my circle 
maybe for something that's still good to sing. I'm not afraid of that. But I got to watch about, and, I'm, and I think we all should watch, what culture are we looking at? What type of person is singing this? You know, they might not be in my type of, my church. Are they a gospel person? Do they love Jesus? Are they straight? Like straight in their natural orientation? And, and so, but what I'm realizing is that music culture, I'm noticing this in the United States, the music culture, especially even the very contemporary Christian music culture is becoming really um, corrupted like, oh, this guy, this famous guy has come out now and now he's, he says he's gay. Or this famous girl who has these wonderful songs and now she's claimed she's a, a lesbian. And I'm not trying to pick on anybody tonight. I'm just going to say, we've got to watch out for that. It can exist right e even among our own music that we're listening to. Like this guy, this is kind of the old school guys. This guy, Ray Bolts. You know, some of you kids, I don't know who that guy is. He's, he's way, in 2008, he left his wife and he's living with a man. And he still goes around the country singing Christian songs in liberal churches. And he thinks it's, everything's fine. And uh, it makes me like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to one of his songs ever anymore. And then there's some others. I got names in it. You could, I mean, here's what one guy said. 1998, CCM star Kirk Franklin said that homeless, this is what he said, homosexuality is a problem today in gospel music, a major concern, and everybody knows it. That's what this guy said. I don't know what it is. Sometimes there's a, there's a culture that can, um, where it can be kind of like tolerated. Um, the Hillsong Group, it's a big, big church that came out of Australia, and they've affected a lot of the music in this country, or the contemporary churches, some of them. Some of them are putting them off now. Um, but the founder of that, there was problems. Well, he, they asked him in 2014, they did an interview with Brian Houston, and he refused to give a definitive answer when asked to clarify his stand on same-sex marriage. He said, the Western world is shifting its thinking on this issue, and churches are struggling to stay relevant. He said, the real issues in people's lives are too important for us to just reduce it down to a yes or no answer in a media outlet. And then this guy, and then he's had, I, I don't relish this stuff. This guy has had a major problem this last year. He had to step down that I just mentioned. And then another Hillsong pastor in New York City, very hip and trendy guy, had so-called celebrities come to his church, Carl Lentz. Hillsong New York City told CNN that Hillsong has a lot of gay men and women in our church, and I pray we always do. Now, I don't, I don't mind if somebody comes in here, but I don't, it's like I, if it, it should, something should change pretty quick. Or it's just something wrong with our preaching, Right? He said, we have a lot of gay men and women in our church, and I pray we always do. And he claimed that he is, quote, still waiting for someone to show me a quote where Jesus addressed it on the record in front of people. In other words, this guy says, there's nothing in the Bible that Jesus said about sexuality. The fact is Jesus, or about homosexuality, the fact is Jesus did say something. When he did miracles in Capernaum, and he did miracles in this other place, and this other place, and they didn't repent. He says, woe to you, this Capernaum. Woe to you, Tyre, or these other places. He says, because if these works were done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. The idea is that that was a legitimate judgment on them that they deserved. However, they could have been saved if they saw what you saw, Capernaum. They could have been saved. So he acknowledges the existence of it and the perversion of it, and the fact that they could have been saved too. And so he says, what are you comparing? Because in the day of judgment, they're going to rise up and say, you should have repented. We didn't get to see that. So here's this man who says, well, that's not in the Bible. And this, this guy too has, he, I hate saying this, this guy blew it that I just read about. And I don't relish that, but I'm just saying sometimes, here's the problem, here's what happens. Oh, we got we to gotta say, God made me strong. Because what happens is as the culture's growing and there's more LGBT stuff coming around us, we kind of want to like, well, okay, well, okay. And we get like that. Don't we get wiggly and squirmy? Yeah. We do. 
But we have to say, I got to govern my life, my decisions, my family, my kingdom, righteously, regardless of this culture. May end up being we have to move again. Get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. But here it is. This is this king, and it's happening. He's ruling. He's allowing it. And it's, it's, an, it's, it's still, it exists among a religious culture. They have their temples, shrines, and all that, and they're still there. But, but last of all, it, it brings about God's chastisement. Now, this was just a little sample of it. God was really just measuring just a little bit. It came to pass, verse 25, in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. Okay, we're not going to read all of it, but it's basically describing, and the other, the other chronicles describe it too, that God says, all right, you're going to be doing that? So now this was unprecedented. Remember what happened to us when we say 9-11 happened? Unprecedented! We have not had an attack on our mainland soil for whatever, since the revolution or something. This was unprecedented. This is the first time since the three kings, the previous, that they had this major uh, threat. I mean, you have Shishak, king of Egypt, saying, I'm going to come up here and get something. And he had a big old army, and it says he came up, and he says, um, he came up and camped against Israel. He took away the treasures, verse 26, of the house of the Lord and treasures of the king's house. He even took away all, he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. And we'll stop right there. The other account tells you some more, and I'll try to describe it in a minute. But Shishak comes up, and, he's, and, he, and he goes, I'm going to start plundering what they have. Now, the only reason why it wasn't worse is because the other Second Chronicles says, and it doesn't show it in this text, but Second Chronicles says that Rehoboam goes, and the princes, and they humbled themselves, it says. They humbled themselves, and God says, all right, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to let him basically take some of this away, and we're going to keep it at that. It was like a little sting because he humbled himself. Humbling is always a safe thing to do in front of God, right? But the point is, is that God says, I'm going to start chastising you for doing this. And God, sometimes I wonder, do you ever just wonder... I know natural disasters happen everywhere, but do you ever, how many of you are like me? Do you ever wonder, like, man, California's always on fire <laughs> for the last, what, 15 years? And then when it's not on fire, they get rain, it's mudslides. Well, that's what happens after all the fires. You're going, oh, hey, guys, do you ever think maybe, you know, <clears throat> and then, you know, we get, we get natural disasters that seem to just, um, Cost so much money, and I'm thinking, where do we get all this money? It brings about God's chastisement. I think maybe we're doing things that God are welcoming the chastisement of God upon us. And so here it is. That's I just wanted you to get an image, and I'm going to give a couple more things. This king, he comes in. They're there. He could have put them out. He doesn't. They still exist among religious culture, and God begins to chastise them. For us, I can't, again, I'm not the king. I can only control what I can control. Here's a couple quick things, and I already said two of them. For us, you and I, the best we can, let's screen our media. Psalm 101, verse 3 and 4, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Hey, kids, if your parents get a little picky about your entertainment, that's okay. They probably see something that they know could affect you adversely in the long run. Let's screen our media. Let's, again, set a good example in our, mar- in our families the best we can. I nobody's perfect. A good example and teach our kids the right form of sexuality at the right time, the sexuality in a proper context at the right time. Number four, let's speak. I, you and I need to speak. We need to say something to people when there's an opportunity to speak to um, the issue of lesbianism, homosexuality, and all that stuff to a person, to a friend, let's say something. We have to say something. And it, you know, again, it, it can, it's kind of, this is what happens, you know, sometimes it happens where it's like, and it, and it causes somebody the hair on their back to, to stand up and they get all what they 
wanted you to be at loving acceptance. They're all mad and angry. But we have to say something. And, and let's still, we have to stand for the Lord. I mean, this is the day and age. It's like so many things are happening. I pray for revival. I hope for it. But so many crazy things are happening around us, aren't they? And we just have to tell ourselves, I'm going to stand for the Lord. I'm going to stand for Jesus. Well, as a church, let's stand for Jesus. There's a guy, you, I don't want to say because things are on video, but there was a guy, one of the members of the church had a relative come a few times. And I knew he was a homosexual man. He's come here a few times. And this was, um, in fact, I met him at a funeral, the family funeral, a few years back. Sat next to him and talked to him. Sodomite. thought, I don't know what I, you know, you try to say what you can, just, and then he came to a service a couple times, and we just did what we always do. We're just going to teach the Bible and get the gospel in there, and I didn't, I don't even think I made this a, a part of my message, like, well, I know this guy's here. I didn't do that, make it where I was preaching against homosexuality. I don't remember that I did. I remember he came a couple times, and his brother, who's a member of the church, said late to me later about a Six months to a year later, he says, you know, my brother so-and-so has renounced homosexuality. And he said, he says he's accepted Christ at Catholic background. And um, he says, but when he came, you ticked him off. You know, <laughs> it was something upset him. It's just the word of God. I mean, I might have sounded irritating, but the word of God... <laughs> which I probably do often, is the Word of God, and it just, it stirred up. You know, it's hard to get, it's hard to get infection out until you poke it, right? Squeeze it out, it's gross, huh? But that's how it is with the soul, with sin. I'm not going to go to Christ until I realize I got an infection. And so he was irritated, but he said he announced it, and he said he accepted Christ. And it's been a couple of years, and so far so good. And when I last checked, and it just, it was encouraging for me to hear that. And I think that our example could be a part of that being a, 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 a friendly church, but we take a stand still. See, some of these other kings, like Asa came in and says, we, we got to get this out. Later on, Joshua says, we're going to clean this out. Years and years and years and years later, Josiah did it too, because it came back in. Sodomites came back in, and you know what? They liked womenly stuff, because they... Hung out by the temple where all the women hang their stuff. There's a feminization of them. And Josiah says, we're going to just destroy the houses. And he cleaned them out. And for us, we, we don't have so much, uh, you know, civil leverage like that, but we have a spiritual responsibility, right, to give the gospel. We have a personal responsibility to um, keep ourselves sexually, morally pure and right, Right? can happen anywhere. And we want to keep this thing, keep ourselves right. Let's take a stand and not move, only except to let our heart be moved with compassion. That's it. But not our position. Lord, thank you for letting us look at this. And it's, um, in a way, easy for me to just pick at this king. But the fact is, he didn't do the right thing all the way through. And you, you wrote this for our learning. And we see sodomites in the land. It's embarrassing to even say it, but it's true. And the perversions around us, and God help us to navigate through that as it's becoming increasingly more trendy and acceptable and laws made to protect it. Help us to still stand in our heart and mind for you, teach our kids the right way, and find moments to give the gospel, I pray. Please, just like you did in the Corinthian church where there were some effeminate, some homosexuals that were saved and washed. May we see that in this uh, uh, greater community happen through our gospel efforts. I pray. Thank you for our time, Lord. And please give your blessing on my family and our church families tonight. In Christ's name, amen. Well, with that... In